The Happy Pair podcast is sponsored by Instant Brand. Use the code Happy Pair to get 20% off for the rest of 2023. What is the purpose and the benefit of rituals? Because, you know, yeah, I think I think that that that's that's the question. I'll just leave it at that. The purpose and the mm-hmm. benefits of rituals. So that's one of the most fascinating aspects of rituals. And that's why it led me to write this book. It's that when you ask people about the purpose of their rituals, sometimes there are rituals that have specific purposes, like in, invoking rain, for example, or seeking salvation or whatever it might be. But most of the time, people just look at you and they go, what do you mean? We just do those things. The, doing the ritual is the purpose itself. So it's a common trait of ritual that it's goal demoted. So it doesn't have an explicit purpose. But that does not mean that it doesn't have a function. And 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 that's what I've spent well, the last 20 years of my life uh, studying. What are those functions? What are the benefits of rituals? And there are, there are quite a lot of these benefits. So we can broadly define them in terms of two major categories. At the individual level, it looks like ritualization helps us um, cope with anxiety. And at the, at the group level, collective rituals, they help people bond together and create social cohesion. Mm, yeah, that, that, that was that was what I thought I was thinking as well. Definitely belonging, like it gives that sense of belonging. Okay, uh, and next thing I was thinking about, okay, so me and Steve, we're identical twins and we're very like habit. Really? I couldn't tell. Yeah, you couldn't tell. <laughs> I but I suppose it. today in Navy jumpers and the same type of shorts. Or, and, and yellow uh, seats. Yellow seats, yeah, yeah, we definitely look at today. But um, we're we're very routine based. Like like we're like a pair of three year olds. Like we get up, we have the same kind of morning routine. We swim in the sea every morning. We wear the same type of clothes. We've lived in the same town for forty years. And I'm going like, where does routine? Where does habit? Where does ritual? Like where where is where does one end and another start? Or are they all just blurred into one? That's a great question. So I I think that there are obviously there are a lot of structural similarities. Uh, uh, in in the things that we call routines and habits and, and rituals, and sometimes the the line is very blurry. But I do have uh, a, a couple of key characteristics that I think are uh, at the core of ritual that might differ from those other things that we do routinely. Um, so if I if I asked you, let me interview you for it. For Brilliant. A while. Yes. All, those Love things it. that you mentioned, uh, those kinds of. Uh, routines. What are they? Na- name some of them. Okay, well, say in the morning we swim in the Irish Sea every morning, all year round, and we do it at sunrise. So it is an aspect, it is routine, which we do every day, but because we do it at sunrise and all year round, there is an aspect of it makes us feel small. So it gives us that sense mm-hmm. of, there is an aspect of divine, like there is an aspect of you feel like a peon getting to that cold sea and it makes you, it gives us something more than just the experience of you and know. I think it takes me out of my mind and suddenly I'm back a connected human being bathing in gratitude. So there is an aspect of the sacred in it, even though it is a daily routine and a daily habit. Great. So I think you, you've, you've already uh, uh, pointed to some of those aspects. Um, some of the things that we do routinely, they might have specific utility. So you swim every day because you want to stay fit. And that might be part of it. But a lot of those activities, they, they often get ritualized. So why do you have to swim every day in sunset? Presumably you don't have a, a good answer to this. It's just because it feels right or just because it just has to be this way, right? And that's where it starts becoming a ritual. When there's this disconnect, what we call causal opacity, there's a disconnect between the goals and the means. So, okay, you swim to stay fit, but why does it have to be at sunset? Well, it's not even to stay fit, like because in winter you're in there for... 40 seconds or not a long time. Like it's just the fitness. It's, it's more the, the stoic principle of embracing discomfort, I would say. And that it makes you feel better that like that, that would be mm-hmm. when I verbalize it, but like as an experience without putting words on it, it just makes my day much better. It makes me enjoy life much more. And I feel like I'm a much nicer person. And I think the reason why the ritual started around sunrise was there was something sacred around the light breaking, darkness becoming light and seeing the change of the seasons. Because in some parts of the world, obviously sunrise, sunset is at the same time, but because we're more northern hemisphere here in Ireland or more northerly up from the equator, sunrise Mm -hmm. in summer is at 4.50 a.m. And then this time of year in winter, it's 8.50 a.m. So it's like there's a huge having to adapt your life to sunrise and to see that thing is beautiful. So that's my effort to articulate it. 
Great. And it's the second time you mentioned this element of sacredness. And yeah. that's the other uh, trait of, of ritual. It it, it 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 makes things meaningful. So our our habits and our routines take something that is useful, that has direct utility, let's say brushing my teeth, and turns into something, well, habitual, something mindless. So I don't have to think about it, so I have to execute it more efficiently. But ritual is something that takes something that might, at, at face value, be uh, meaningless and had no uh, direct utility and turns it into something meaningful. Um, and by doing that, it also demarcates those two different domains, the, the mundane, uh, the profane, as some anthropologists have called it, and the sacred. And, and one thing you see with, uh, with ritual is that when, when something gets in the way, if you can't perform your ritual, if somebody prevents you from doing that, then you find that really disturbing because it's exactly this sense of uh, sacredness. And, and this sense of sacredness doesn't have to be specifically religious. So it's not necessarily part of any established religious doctrine. Uh, it means that it's something very meaningful to us. So it could be the aspect of like someone listening and going that they know someone who, or they themselves, or they know someone that has a meditation practice and they meditate every morning and then some it's, morning they can't do it, they feel a little bit disturbed and all day they're going, oh, it's because I didn't meditate this morning or whatever it might be. And that, exactly. that is a, a direct, you know, that, that must be a ritualistic practice. Yes, one domain in which this is very obvious is the all of those rituals, the things that some sometimes we call superstitions, perform among athletes. Now, it's, I'm not I'm not a great fan of the word superstition. It it doesn't it's not a good uh, term scientifically speaking because it simply describes things that the the, the dominant religious uh, establishment rejects. Um, uh, to me, those things are rituals just like any others. So if you look at the rituals that athletes perform. Uh, they can be very elaborate, and and if they're uh, um, uh, prevented from performing them, there are even experimental studies that show that their performance drops. And that's not because of any magical causation. That's because they're uh, they get upset, uh, their their mental concentration is, is disturbed, and they lose confidence. Yeah, my understanding of that is, say, for example, a penalty kicker or a goal kicker or something in a stadium of sixty thousand people or a hundred thousand people or and ten million people, whatever it is. The routine or the ritual is it's to get them back into the flow of this is the same thing I do every day, whether I'm doing it in the pr training ground or in front of 60,000 people. I just go through the same process. It brings me in the present moment and I just perform my kick or whatever it might be to the same standard, regardless of who's there. So that's that's my understanding from a... Exactly. And everybody knows. And that's what the fans are trying to do. What the goalie is trying to do. They're trying to mess with, the, uh, with their mind of the penalty taker, right? And their job... Uh, is to to stay calm and to not pay attention to anything else that is happening. And that's where ritual comes in very handy. Mm, uh, helps. It helps you reduce anxiety, block all external stimuli and focus on the ritual itself. Mm, very yeah. good. So back to back to again, you're too, you know, you, you said at the start that rituals, there's that sense of belonging and that sense of connection with other people. And then there's the other aspect of ritual, which is reducing anxiety, reducing stress and bringing us back to the present moment. So yeah, very, very good. Lovely. Uh, can okay, I, can, I, can I go? You, you're, you're, you're hogging. Go for it. You're doing great. So we've partnered with Instant Brand and they really are helping people and helping us rethink the way we cook. One of my favorites is their Vortex Versus Own Air Fryer with a clear cook window. It's got this big drawer where like, I know there's a craze about air fryers, but this is the air fryer of air fryers. I love it. Yeah, it really is. And um, they've also got a, a Vortex Plus air fryer oven. There's an Instant Pot Superior slow cooker, which is really cool because you can actually saute first before you slow cook all in the same pot. And it's and a it's, great way of making healthy food just easy. It to really cook. is. Well, well that, like I, I honestly use the air fryer and the Instant Pot all the time. Like I genuinely do at home. Click the link down below in our show notes and avail of these wonderful ways to rethink the way you cook. Rites of passage. You know, in many traditional cultures, there was always rites of passage, as in, say, some an, ad an adolescence moving into adulthood. Often they'd go on some journey of a rite of passage. If you look at kind of watching that movie, The Gladiator, the young boy had to go out and survive 30 days in the woods and he comes back with a wolf on his back and suddenly he's seen as a man. And, you know, his mother's crying when he's leaving the, the little boy. And nowadays in modern, modern day society, many of these rites of passage are missing or they've lost their meaning. If I look at you know. a stag... Traditionally, I believe... What do you mean by stag? A stag. When a man is going off to get married, often what he'd do is they'd 
in traditional cultures, they used to humiliate him, but his friends would stand around and look at him when he's at his weakest and say, we got your back, even when you're feeling at your lowest. And I think that's what it traditionally was, whereas nowadays it's often just lads getting drunk and abusing one another. And it's, it's turned into a different meaning. I wonder, are rites of passage like this rituals? And what was their purpose? Was it th to signify these, these transition periods of life? They, they absolutely are rituals, and, and it's a story as old as, as time, at least as, as human time. Uh, for as far as we know, our, our species has had every major transition in our lives has been marked by, by ritual. Whether it's the birth of a child, or a, uh, a new union, uh, a marriage, um, or uh, adolescence, or becoming an adult, or death for that matter, uh, everything is shrouded in ritual. And in our mind, those things are, are connected. So we expect uh, major events to be ritualized. That's what we do, for example, in birthdays. That's what we do when we have a, a great accomplishment. Well, if we if we graduate from uh, university or uh, have any kind of major success in the professional uh, arena, I, I bet that the first thing you want to do is get your friends together and, and make a toast or, or uh, uh, have a party. Um, and because our brain is used to uh, um, having these markers of great transitions, uh, it also perceives a, a more flamboyant, more elaborate ritual as marking a more important uh, transition. Mm. I, I bet that in every culture, uh, you will see that some of the most flamboyant, some of the most elaborate, some of the most massive rituals are weddings. Uh, at the collective uh, level. Some of the most elaborate rituals would be things like presidential inaugurations or uh, royal coronations, as it recently happened in, in England. Yeah, oh, and so, so on and so forth. So elaborate and so just huge. Of course. They, they have to be. They have to be to get this sense of momentousness. Yeah, so and I think the, the pandemic was the, um, was the perfect example about how much these uh, rituals matter. You know, when um, uh, when things began to to look bad in the pandemic in 2020, the, the first day that my university announced that we're going to close for the foreseeable future, I announced this in my class. I went in, into my first class in the morning and I said, look, this is the, uh, the directive. Um, so let's talk about the plan forward. Um, and do you have any... So I told them what the plan was and then I said, do you have any questions? And the first question I got was, what about our graduation ceremony? Are we going to have one? And at the time I said, well, we, we don't know. For the moment, we're only closing for a month. But frankly, I don't think it's going to happen. And of course, it didn't happen. And I could see everybody was so disappointed. And I've heard this again and again from people who, who didn't have a graduation ceremony, both during the pandemic, but also uh, for various reasons, that they felt that their accomplishment was diminished. You also saw during the pandemic that people who lost somebody not having a proper send-off, not, not being able to have a, a proper funeral was really hurtful to these uh, to these people. Or others, uh, you know, young kids who wanted to celebrate their birthdays or, or people who wanted to celebrate their weddings. They look, sometimes I've, I've spoken with people who look back and they, they feel very bummed about the fact that they couldn't have the big wedding that they wanted. And some of them, in fact, um, uh, had a, a second wedding after the pandemic to celebrate it properly. So rituals matter for people. Ritual, that, that's a great like, point. That, that's a really good distinction there because, you know, they're just part of how we live and we don't even think about it. But when you say when we're taken away, like in the pandemic, it's it when you just articulate it, it's so apparent. It really, really like is. Rituals are humans' big events. Like it's the biggest, it's where humans feel the most. Like when humans feel they the are. most, you know, celebratory, it's a big event. And when humans are at their, you know, death, it, there's a, again, it needs they a are, and, and it, it, you know, from a, from a naive perspective, they might seem silly, but uh, anthropologists have pointed out or, from a very long time that they are deeply meaningful. Instead, some of them have went uh, as far as to say that they are they're the only meaningful things. Emil Durkheim, for example, uh, uh, said that society can be divided into basically two phases. One is the, the everyday, the, the mundane phase that he called the, the profane, where we just go about making a living. And the other phase is when we, we perform those activities that we might call rituals. It's all of those things that might, uh, at first glance, seem meaningless, 
that make life in those societies feel sacred. So it's when we get together to enjoy a, cer- a meal in a ceremonial way. Of course, we could eat in five minutes. If you're like me, you could eat in two minutes. <laughs> uh, but we get together and we sit around the table for an hour and we we make toast and we clean our glasses and, and we turn it into something more ritualized. Even the, the ordinary actions, we ritualize them. Or we get together as families. And you can extend this to say the only time a group is really a group is during the performance of those collective rituals. When does an extended family come together as a family, ever? It's only during uh, things like weddings and 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 Thanksgiving and, and funerals. When does a body of students ever come together, per se, uh, is to perform a graduation ceremony? When do football fans ever come together as a as a group, as a collective? It's to enact those ritualized uh, uh, interactions that take place in the terraces. Rituals really help us enrich and celebrate life. They do. They really do. Like last night we went carol singing. So it's, it's Christmas time here in Ireland and there's a traditional that's been going on about a hundred years or maybe ritual is the word. I don't know if I, ritual or traditional. Um, for about a hundred years, people would come together, they'd sing Christmas carols and they'd collect money for local charities. And for us, it always signifies it's the start of the Christmas series, period. Uh-huh. We can, we've been doing it for about 30 years. And I remember, you know, we, when we were much younger, obviously we do it with our mom and dad and now I'm doing it with my kids and it feels real like this tradition or ritual is being passed down. Where does tradition uh, and, start? And, and, and w- rit- w- w- one thing I wondered about this, which is an aspect of rituals, is that, like, say, for example, with carol singing, people are all singing together. They're singing the same song. So immediately via audio, like vocals, voices, people are united. And there is that sense of like, losing yourself to the greater. Or, or you use that word, that collective effervescence, I've heard you mention. Oh, lovely word. Which is that word where everyone is united, that sense of coming together collectively and certainly via carol singing or via dancing these tend to be experiences where people feel that unity more so because there is that um direct example of it absolutely and if you if you think about um you know historically when was the time where uh, at some point our ancestors what was the first instance in which a, a group of human beings stopped being a, just a, a bunch of individuals and and became a unit Presumably, it was it was something like dancing around a campfire, and this is something that we see uh, to this day when we get together to enact those uh, rituals, especially the most emotional ones or the most physically demanding ones, just like dancing together or, or chanting together, uh, whether it's in a stadium or whether it's uh, at somebody's door singing carols. Um, people get this feeling of of being one with the group, and this is in fact something that can be measured. So my team and I were the first ones to provide uh, qualitative evidence of this feeling of collective effervescence. We thought that this, if if this is true, and we I, I had heard this from my participants uh, when they were performing rituals, they would again and again people would tell me that they they have this feeling of togetherness that it's very hard to describe, and they they feel like one. And some people would specifically say that they feel that their hearts uh, beat as one. And so we went out and tested this. And we went into the context of a, of a Spanish firewalking ritual. And we found that as uh, this ritual was performed, there were thousands of people around, but only a handful of them were walking through fire and others were just watching. And of course, there were so many outsider spectators there. So we put heart rate monitors on, on, uh, on people from all of these different groups. And we also mapped the social network of the billets. So we knew who was connected to whom by blood or by, by friendship. We even had a pair of twins in our in our sample. And we, we saw that, uh, first of all, there was a, an extraordinary level of uh, physiological synchrony, therefore emotional synchrony. So people's heart rates did start beating uh, like one, um, oh, wow. or at least their, their heart rate patterns were synchronized, uh, no matter what they were doing, whether they were the ones walking on fire or just watching. And, and it didn't but matter this, about the distance, like if it was 200 yards uh, or 100 yards. It, or 100 it, it, not that distance, but social distance matter. Oh, so yeah, the closer you were to someone, uh, the, 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 the more your heart rate patterns were aligned. And in fact, when we look at the pair of twins, their heart rates were identical. One of them is going through the fire, the other one is watching, and their heart rates are basically identical. Wow. You could actually test that. <laughs> but but I totally get that because like, say, for example, if I'm watching my son play football and he's a big kick, I'm there 
as nervous as he is. And I'm like, geez, I wish <laughs> I was playing. At least I have an outlet to express this rather than standing here and go, go on, son, go on, son. Absolutely. So and then later we did these uh, studies with um, sports fans as well. We did, uh, we did similar measurements with basketball fans in the US and football fans in Brazil. And what we find is that another very important part of these rituals is the, the physical component, the, the physical co-presence. So the actions matter. The embodied aspect of ritual is very important. That's why during the pandemic, people felt that their rituals were diminished. Even if they were able to do something online, it was not the real thing. So like, so a, graduation, a, that, like a graduation ceremony online was never exactly. the same unifying celebration as it would have been in person. Exactly. It was something. It was better than nothing, I guess, but it was not the same thing. So for example, with uh, uh, sports fans, we see that when we have them watch a game live uh, as a group, either in the stadium or uh, uh, in front of the television, the groups that watch the game in the stadium, their heart rates are more synchronized compared to groups that watch them on television. And um, that synchrony predicts both their satisfaction with the game, how meaningful they found the game to be, and how bonded they feel to other fans. Wow. And what about, so, so that, would, that, that instance would be the rituals that would be unifying and give that sense of community and collective. Mm -hmm. um, and what about the other ones? Say about the complete other apps, that, ones that help us manage stress, like rituals that help us manage stress. What are some examples of them? So to study this, we, we conducted a series of experiments, both in the lab and in real life settings. So we started by testing the idea that there is a link between ritualization and anxiety to begin with. So we brought people into the lab uh, with my colleagues in the, um, in the laboratory for the experimental research on religion in the Czech Republic. And we stress them up. One of the easiest ways to stress people up is to put them on the spot and, and have them engage in public speaking uh, when they're unprepared. So we told them they had to, three minutes to prepare a, a talk about an object of art that they were going to deliver in front of a panel of art critics. That freaked them out. And we could <laughs> we could measure this and their well, uh, heart rates. That but... must have been an awful <laughs> and quite funny oh, yeah. thing to do. And uh, also in their self-report. So they, they feel more stressed. We see they're more stressed. And then we, we use motion sensors to look at their behavior, how they behave when they're more stressed. And we find that people who are more stressed, they engage in more ritualized behaviors. So when they clean an object, for example, they follow the same patterns again and again and again, obsessively. So that was the first step, to establish this link between ritualization, what we defined as, uh, as these patterned, rigid, redundant, and repetitive behaviors. Uh, there's a link between that and anxiety. And then we went into uh, real life. We went into um, um, uh, the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, in into Hindu temples. And we used our physiological monitors with people who are practicing their uh, regular religious rituals. And those two are rituals in that context that involve repetition. So they stand in front of the statues of different Hindu deities, and they make these offerings and hand movements that are pretty repetitive. It, the whole thing lasts about 10 minutes. And we compared them to a control group that was at a, a similar setting, same dimensions as the temple, but didn't perform any ritual. And we see that um, performing those rituals helps people reduce anxiety. We see this in their heart rate variability, and we also see it in the self-report. So they feel less stressed. Their body shows that they are less stressed. In other experiments, we collected uh, hormonal samples at the University of uh, Connecticut. And we saw that people who take part in more uh, rituals of their own community, they have lower cortisol levels. Wow, rituals. And indeed. going back into the lab, we also look at the, the components of ritual. And we so we, we induce people to engage in those highly structured movements or utterances. So similar uh, to repeating a, a, a prayer verse or verses, um, or just engaging repetitive hand movements. That again helps reduce anxiety. But of course, when you take that from the lab and you move it into a real life setting, the effect is stronger because then you have the you have belief that also comes into it. Wow. And on the topic of stress reduction, so a lot of people will conduct rituals to help reduce stress. At 
like I, I know my wife's a psychologist and she'll often deal with people with OCD and OCD, like mm -hmm. an obsessive compulsive disorder, they might, you know, wash their hand 30 times before they leave the door and walk 35 steps to get to the door and open the handle and close it four times and then walk out. And if they break the ritual, they got to start again. At what point does a ritual move into kind of OCD and move that line? Or is there such a thing or is it just a spectrum? Yeah, uh, so of course. So if you look at the uh, the statistical manual for psychological disorders, ritual hyper ritualization is one of the symptoms of OCD, and I think that's that's the point where it becomes maladaptive when when your brain no longer provides the feedback that the action has been performed, and therefore you have to stop now. Uh, in in OCD, the action is just repeated uh, internally, and if anything, it's self reinforcing. The more you do it, the more you want to to do it again. There, there's, there's no feedback that tells you that, okay, now you can stop and relax because you've done the, the ritual. Yeah. Wow, and, and then I think of the complete other extreme and like, when I think of the likes of, you know, these deities, whatever people's religions may be, but say, for example, a Buddha of some form where their whole life is sacred, everything about like mm -hmm. all the simple actions of life are lived with a sacred, you know, aspect like that almost their whole life is ritualized. And that's the aspect of a, of an enlightened being to degree is that there is no meaningless. There's just absolute, everything is a gift to the sacred and the divine and whatnot. And this is, you know, in theory, the ultimate evolution of a human consciousness or whatnot. What are your thoughts on that? Or is that complete gibberish? Well, I, I, and this is, this might be, you know, uh, what people are, are told to aspire to become, but of course it, it might be unattainable. And, and we don't really know what, what Buddha did in his, in his role, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but but these are, the fact that these are such rare cases shows you how, how difficult it, it would be. To, you need to balance. You need to, In order for those rituals to feel sacred in the first place, you need to move back and forth between the, the mundane world and that of uh, uh, of the sacred, I think. Yeah, so this is a balance between light and dark and sacred and the, the everyday. And if there's too much ritual and too much trying to everything to be this big, a gift to the greater, whatever it might be, whatever input deity of choice, um, there's some Yes, they can, they can be too much of anything. So if you, if you engage in too many of those um, routinized rituals, um, then they simply become boring. Um, um, my uh, doctoral advisor... Um, who taught me, by the way, very close to where you are, at Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, he calls this, uh, his name is Carvey Whitehouse, he calls this the tedium effect. And you see that, that uh, for example, religious groups that become too written, it's just like it happened with the, uh, uh, with Protestantism, they end up becoming just too boring. And today, if you see in the United States, for example, some of the most uh, extravagant rituals in the context of Christianity are, are splinter groups that have come uh, from within Protestantism as a reaction to this uh, 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 sort of more boring form of ritualization. Well, that they've gone even more, they've made it more elaborate and more, you know, fantastic. Yeah, think of some snake handlers or think of uh, all kinds of uh, uh, ecstatic uh, behaviors. Yeah. So hyper ritual routinization can lead to this tedium effect. And on the other hand, of course, uh, too much excitement can also be... Uh, uh, taxing. Yeah. You don't want to have um, a fire walking ritual every day. You save this for once a year. You know you don't have the, the big uh, New Year's fireworks display uh, once a week. You save it for a special moment. Yeah, good point. Good point. Um, I'd love to talk about. Um, so, like, obviously, you've been doing this for your. This has been your life as an anthropologist and whatnot. And I'd love if we could talk about like, you know, modern life, it's become less secular in our lifetime. You know, there's less religious hold uh -huh. on society. And when I think of when most people, when I originally started researching about rituals, it was like, oh, my own association was more religious context. It was like, OK, yeah, and, you know, they're they're obviously sacred. There's some kind of religious aspect. Of and now it, now in current society, it seems like there's less, you know, there's less. Um, rituals in a sense. But then when I think of the idea of football matches and birthdays and whatnot, do you see any difference between, are there more rituals, are there less rituals? Is it, is, are we, uh, or is it just where there's humans, there's always going to be rituals? I think it's the latter. Where, where, where there's humans, there's always going to be rituals. It feels in, in, um, in modern times, and especially in the West, because religion uh, is declining, at least traditional forms of religiosity are declining, sometimes, and it's because of the fact that religion has monopolized ritual for so long, 
uh, in human history. It feels like there, because there's less religion, there are fewer rituals, but that's not true. Instead, what, what is happening is that those rituals are, are shifting into other domains. And that's obviously very clear when you look at um, um, uh, new forms of uh, spirituality, new age groups, uh, things that you might uh, um, see in places like California, where people are, are, are increasingly engaging with uh, Eastern practices like yoga and, and meditation, or you might look at the, into the secular domain and you look at you look at what's happening at uh, rock concerts and pop concerts and football stadiums. I mean, when thirty people come together to chant and dance together, what do you call that if not a ritual? Call that. There was fun. a time when this would only happen when it was orchestrated by by a high priest. But today, our high priest, uh, priests and priestesses might be people like Taylor Swift, DJs. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, exactly. And DJs, wow. yeah. Strange to think of it like that. Wow. Well, well, when I think of it in a sense, like some of the times when I felt most free in my life is dancing. You're out there, you're with a whole load of strangers and you're just completely lost in the moment. And you look across the room at some complete stranger and you feel so connected with them through your smile or through whatever's going on. But I think in my sense, when I think of that um, collective effervescence word, it's like those are the experiences which I can most relate to is at a, a nightclub or a festival or something where there's just this absolute collective energy and such a sense of unity where you you lose all that sense of anxiety or stress yeah. because you feel, I am one with everyone. I don't know who any of these people are, but I feel so close to them. Yeah, and in and, and one sense, we might think of those things are, as very modern. So the nightclub is a very modern activity to do. But when you look at what people are doing, this, this is what we've been doing as a species for thousands of, of years, just getting together and dancing. It could be around the campfire, or it could be um, in a disco. Mm, yeah, very interesting. It's just the context has changed, but the activities are still mm -hmm. very much the same. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if we could talk about some of the more extreme rituals because uh, like, there's some incredible options. Like you've mentioned fire walk and we've gone, oh yeah, fire walking and we just kind of breezed over it. But um, like, obviously, you know, I, I, fire walking is not part of my everyday life. I I think we did it once. We went to a Tony Robbins event years ago and we walked on fire coals or whatnot. But fire walking seems like a very extreme thing. And I'd love if you could talk about fire walking and, and about the Tamils because uh, those seem like mm -hmm. incredible um, examples of rituals. Yeah, so in my own research, I, I took the stance that because ritual poses this paradox, why do people do things that are seemingly uh, useless? Uh, I wanted to explore this, to, to push this paradox to, to its extreme. Uh, because it becomes more obvious when you look at uh, some of these rituals that I've studied that involve physical pain and suffering. Why do people do those things? So I started by, uh, for my doctoral dissertation, I I went to my home country. I, I was born in Greece. And I studied a group of uh, Orthodox Christians who performed firewalking rituals. And I did the same in uh, parts of Bulgaria and in Spain. So those are the parts of Europe where you find firewalking rituals uh, those are typically in a, in a Christian context. But then when I was done with my dissertation, I thought, okay, um, what are some even more intense rituals that I could find? And I started looking uh, into the ethnographic literature and I came across some of the practices of Tamil Hindus. So those are the things that uh, traditionally you find in the southern part of India, but also wherever there are members of the Tamil diaspora, which is throughout the world. And I ended up going to the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean because it met a lot of the criteria that I had set. And I wanted a small place where I could find people again and again. I didn't want it to be very chaotic. So I ended up going there to study those rituals. And there's fire walking there. There's also a practice that is called sword climbing that involves people walking um, on a um, climbing ladder that, that is uh, built of uh, upright uh, knives. Wow. And there's um, also the, the most intense of all of those rituals is the type of some comedy. Well, and this involves a, a series of hardships. It's basically an entire day of, of self-imposed suffering. That includes things like carrying a, a large miniature shrines, which uh, can weigh sometimes up to 80 kilos. And you carry them for the entire day in a procession. And that's under the tropical sun. And it's the middle of the summer in Mauritius. And they're barefooted and their, their feet are burning on the asphalt. And sometimes they walk on shoes made of nails. But that's just the beginning. Uh, because the, the most painful part is that they have their body pierced with uh, needles 
and hooks and skewers. Some of the, those skewers can be the size of broomsticks and they go through the cheeks. And they're so big that they have to bite down at them and hold them with both hands at all times. Otherwise, they'll rip their face off. And um, some of them will have hooks uh, through the skin of their back. And by those hooks, they, they drag these large chariots. The, the bigger um, uh, ones are, they can be the size of minivans. Oh my. And sometimes they are so tall that somebody has to go ahead of them in the procession and use a bamboo pole to lift the electricity wires so they can go underneath. Oh my. And way. they go like this for an entire day. And in the context where I've studied this, when they reach the temple, now they have to climb a, a, a hill to get there. It's, there are 242 steps to the top, and they have to carry all that weight with them. And it's only when they reach that temple. This temple is dedicated to Lord Muruga, the Hindu deity. It's only when they reach the temple they can put it down. Uh, uh, this whole thing takes between four and, and ten hours. And during all this time, they, they don't drink any water. They, they can't have anything to eat. They can't put their weight down. Um, I mean, it's it's really self-imposed uh, torture. Well, and, and so like so it sounds like absolute masochism. And I'm just wondering, what is the purpose of this ritual? Like, because everyone listening has gone, that just sounds so awful. Yeah, but but is what, the, is, what is the reason I, for it? Can I go, is the reason that it's... Like, I know when I get in the sea, it's self-imposed discomfort, or one could call it masochism, like the cold, the exposure. And when I come out, I've survived it. And there's this feeling of like, ah, oh, relief. And I wonder, is that uh -huh. it in itself, that or is there no is. meaning in it? So one of the most interesting things about this, is because I've asked thousands of people why they perform this ritual. Thousands of people the have done common, this. The, the most common answer is uh, because... That's what we do because it's tradition, because it's who we are. So uh, they're they're just referring to external causes, or or just they look at me and they go, I don't know, that's what we do. Uh, but there's also a multitude of other uh, interpretations, and as you as you keep asking people, they they bring up different explanations. Uh, nobody has has uh, given me the impression, not a single person, that there's some uh, sense of masochism here, because people have grown this. A lot of people have asked me whether there's a parallel between this and uh, BDSM practices. <laughs> Nobody has ever told me that we do this because we we like to embrace the pain, or it's the relief from the pain that, that gives you uh, satisfaction. No, they, they do see this, they, they perceive this as suffering, but they don't do it to suffer. They do it as a, the suffering is the means here. Uh, they might refer to it as a sacrifice. That's a word that comes up very often. It's a sacrifice that they're making to satisfy the deity. Now, of course, if you ask them why would the deity want you to suffer, then the, um, they might not have an answer for that. Um, having said that, they also have some ideas about what this does for them. So they might uh, say things like uh, it helps them um, bond with uh, family, or it helps them cope with uh, illness, or it boosts their well-being. In fact, we did a study where we, uh, we tried to test this. We used uh, wearable sensors to see, first of all, to see how much they're suffering. And we found that by any measure, so either by looking at the number of needles in their bodies or by looking at the uh, their electrodermal activity, which is a measure of stress, this is the most stressful day of their lives. I mean, orders of magnitude are more stressed than anything else they, they do. But then we see that when we look at their subjective well-being a couple of months later, uh, not only is it increased, but it is actually increased proportionally to the degree of suffering. So the more needles they put in their body or the more uh, stress they've experienced, the greater the boost in their subjective well-being a couple of months later. Wow. So this this it sounds like this could potentially be an untapped health hack for the modern era. You know, like when you say that, it's like their well-being is in proportion to the amount of needles and pain. Yeah, well, it's not necessarily untapped because... What I think of some of my friends who run marathons, to me, that's just self-imposed torture. I don't, I don't get that. <laughs> but to them, I can really see that they perceive this to be a, a meaningful uh, part of their lives and one that boosts their well-being. Wow, great distinction there. Yeah, I guess that, it's just that, various that, degrees of, of that are as our ability to to carry hardship and suffering, thus our ability to tolerate. The, the vicissitudes or the challenges of life increases in capacity. Nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there, there are a lot of dimensions to that, but one of them undeniably is the fact that uh, we're used to, our brain infers value from effort. So the things that take uh, that are really hard 
we derive satisfaction from doing those things and achieving those things. Right? Why do people try to climb Mount Everest? Hundreds of people have died trying to climb Everest, but they still do it. Uh, well, for that matter, why do we raise children? Why do we do all these other difficult things? It is those things precisely that, that are the most meaningful things in our lives. So this connection is, becomes very apparent to our brain in, in, in rituals. The, the tougher a ritual, the, the, um, the more meaningful it seems. Wow. And, and Jeez, what, we're a crazy bunch, humans, aren't we? When I hear you talk yeah. about it like this, it's like, wow, we are mental. We are just... We are a fascinating species, yes. <laughs> That's a better, a better angle on it. I prefer yeah. your angle on it. I've, I've, got, I've got so many questions and I'm just thinking... This for, is wonderful, by the way, Dimitri. It really, really, really is. The thank you so much. Your work is wonderful. Really, really is. I'm thinking for anyone thank listening you. and for ourselves, I'm kind of going, okay, rituals in every day. How can I... How can I put rituals to benefit and enhance my life? Obviously, there's awareness now of going, okay, there's two aspects of rituals. Number one, it brings that sense of belonging, connection, community, which a lot of us are missing, you know, when we want more of. And the other one is it helps alleviate stress and anxiety and whatnot. And how can like, is there a recipe to get more rituals in your life? Is there any kind of like, like you obviously live it and have been, it's been part of your life for 20 years. How, how do you kind of, how would anyone listening apply this to better their own life? Well, it, I, it's not very difficult because of the fact that there are, there are millions of rituals around. So there, there's, there's plenty for you to, to choose from. Um, the key is to find rituals that feel meaningful to you. And that becomes tricky because if you look at other people's rituals, they tend to look silly. Like when, when, when I look at their, the, the royal coronation or, or the opening of the British Parliament, it, it looks utterly absurd to me. But to the insiders, it, it feels very solid and, and meaningful. The, the same goes for everything else. Like if you, if I show a, a video of, of uh, my birthday celebration to to somebody uh, in Papua New Guinea, they might find it just utterly bizarre. Uh, so finding something that just feels right for you and, and doesn't feel outright silly, that's the challenge. But the good news is that there are rituals everywhere we look. Now, when it comes to collective rituals, I think you have you. It might be useful to start with a group. To start with the the kind of group you feel an affiliation uh, with, and, and see what kinds of rituals they have that you might be part of. And at at first, it might feel awkward, but uh, but it's only by doing your rituals that they stop feeling awkward. Um, the first time we engage in any kind of ritual in our lives, it's probably not because we would. We start with an idea. We start with a religious belief, for example. No, it's probably because our parents dragged us to church. But when they when, when they make you go for, for 20 years, then eventually you come to find this meaningful. In my uh, experience, I, I felt this when I moved from Greece to Denmark. That was the first time that I left my home country. I went there as a, as a student. And eventually I, I, I got a faculty position there. And at first I, I had the impression that... Um, the Danes had a very poor work ethic because every once in a while they would just stop working and they would gather together to perform what I have, what I eventually come to realize were social rituals. So they would get together for lunch every every day. But even if you didn't have lunch with you, or if you, if you already had lunch, or if you were not hungry, you would still join the group. Or uh, they would organize massive uh, end of semester or or uh, or Christmas uh, celebrations. And then you could see that they were really sacred for the for the faculty. Not because they, it was Christmas; most of them were atheists, but um, because it was a collective ritual. And not going to those rituals was was not well perceived. Uh, and at first, all of these things they 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 seemed like silly distractions from work. But then soon, I realized that in my own example, because of my work is so collaborative and interdisciplinary that most of my own collaborations, they started by getting to know somebody in the context of those rituals. So the social part matters a lot. Mm. And and I realized that uh, the teams I was working with in my professional life were more cohesive teams, partly because of those rituals that we enacted together day in, day out. Very good. So it really just helped the group to come together better and encouraged social dynamics and social diversity and that sense mm -hmm. of belonging where people could, you know, talk to other, you know, other people that they might not normally. So it seems like there's a really good shopping list for anyone who wants to adopt more 
considered or conscientious selection of rituals to make them feel more unified in terms of collective and also avert stress or anxiety is to pick something within your own culture. It's try to pick mm-hmm. something. It's going to feel strange the first ritual you do. And like a ritual could be going to a sports game and deciding I'm going to support the Toronto Blue Jays and I'm going to wear a hat and I'm going to go to 25 games this year and I'm going to learn their song. Mm-hmm. Another aspect to pay attention to, so in terms of your uh, question, is what are the elements of ritual that contribute to each one of those effects that we've discussed? So when it comes to um, to team bonding, those might be things like synchrony uh, or uh, uh, shared emotional arousal. So collective rituals that involve uh, moving together in time, things like marching in the military, for example, or chanting together. Uh, singing, dancing, uh, or sometimes playing sports, all of those things uh, help boost uh, group cohesion. When it comes to reducing anxiety, then the key aspects of ritual that we look into are things like repetition and and rigid structure. And that's why things like the fidget spinner have been uh, so uh, successful. Uh, Or in Greece, for example, I might have something like this here. I don't suppose you know what this is, like or maybe you do. Like rosary it, looks, it looks like a ba- well, it looks like a baby chew toy, or it also looks so like a small little rosary bead. It is a type of rosary. So in in Greece, uh, we call this kumbaloi. So this um, originally it was just used by by monks to to count prayers. It was a rosary, but eventually it became something that everybody carried around in their pockets, and they would just fidget with it. They're very elaborate. I'm not very good at this, but people can play with this in, in very elaborate ways. And you will see them use it in, especially at times of uh, high stress. So, so football coaches or players were uh, on the bench, they might they might use it at, at times of uh, stress. Um, and it's precisely because those types of repetitive movements help alleviate anxiety. It is rituals that have those types of features, doing the same thing again and again and again in a very structured and rigid way uh, that can have the, the best benefits um, yeah, on that front. That, that, that makes me think of two things in terms of stress reduction. Number one, like breath work is it's become very popular in the last decade. Mm-hmm. And it's the same, like there's the same repetitive routine in terms of breathing. And I think of yoga, another one, which is, you know, you got your sun salutations and there's repetitive and repetitive and it's, the breathing is the same and it tends to be very effective at relieving anxiety and stress. Yeah, and exactly. Well, that's particular effect because it happens directly at the, uh, at the, at the body level. It, it, it is an embodied practice. So the repetition comes from from your own muscles and, 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 your, and your own body tissues. Wow, amazing. And what are, what are some of the other, are there any other, like, because we touched on firewalk and we kind of breezed over it. it. Like, what would these kind of, um, you said they typically came from Christian backgrounds, the firewalking, you and know, in Spain and Bulgaria and, and Greece and whatnot. What, would, what, what did those people say about the purpose of the firewalking? Did they have any, was it similar to the Tamils experience, the, in, you know, the Tamil people? There, there tend to be similarities in, in how people reason about these. And so compare the, the Greek context where the, that group was very highly religious, a group of Orthodox Christians, um, and um, the group in Spain, which was, was so a bit of a mix. So that was, it seems like this ritual was uh, entirely religious at some point, but today people do it mostly because it's their tradition. That's what they would say. They don't, they don't necessarily refer to religious uh, explanations. They say that's just who we are. But nonetheless, it's just a sacred. So they consider this as a fundamental part of their uh, personal and collective identity. They say that the, the name of the village is San Pedro Manrique. and say that this is what makes you San Pedro. Uh, San Pedro without this festival would, would not be San Pedro. Now, in religious context, people uh, often have other notions about this. In Greece, for example, they, they very often talked about healing. There's this relationship between them and two saints, Constantine and Helen, uh, and they perform the, um, the firework for them, in honor of, of them. So there's this idea that people who suffer from uh, certain illnesses, especially mental uh, afflictions, uh, that they could be healed by, by being chosen uh, by the uh, the saints to walk on fire. And that brings us to an, uh, another component of those rituals. So there are, there are healing practices throughout the, the world. And those 
in in contexts where certain illnesses are accompanied by by stigma, these rituals can play a fundamental role in in essentially liberating these individuals from that social stigma. Because the moment that you're perceived as as being chosen um, by the the deity to take part in that ritual, you stopped uh, becoming a a, a, a prior. You're, you're no longer the uh, the per, the person who suffers from X is the person who's been chosen for X, and that allows you to reconceptualize your your illness to to um, to be better placed to socialize, and in fact, it makes you a desirable person to socialize with, and it can be really helpful. Uh, a lot of people who take part in those rituals might be suffering from things like uh, uh, depression, for example, and in in the past um, and to to a great degree uh, in the present in many societies. Uh, those individuals might be discouraged from going to the to the doctor because of social stigma. They might choose to self isolate instead. But when somebody comes and pulls you out and says, "No, you're the chosen one. You have to do this, and we'll take care of you, and you will be healed," you have both um, hope, optimism, um, and the social context to help you uh, express that optimism. So wow. those can be very important, in, especially in societies that don't have direct access. Uh, or for whatever reason, people are prevented from from seeking that access to healthcare. Well, that's an that incredible great. practice, incredible practice. And I think back to like San Pedro, the people who kind of, you know, we're San Pedro and we walk on fire once a year and that makes us San Pedro. And like, how do these things start? Because like, you know, like we live in a little town, like why don't we start walking on fire this week? And that makes us, you know, unites us as a town. We all walk on fire. Like, how do these things happen? Or like, when and you is, go back- it, is it about someone just carrying the torch? Because like, when I think back to us starting swimming in the sea at sunrise, it just, it was about showing up and just showing up and eventually momentum builds and it just, it moves from being a mm-hmm. habit to be a part of your identity. You know, that famous expression, Don't- be care of your, be careful of your actions because ap- actions become habits and habits become characteristic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very true of ritual. So uh, very often we, we, we begin by the action and then we, we come to uh, to embody that action as, as part of who we are. Uh, but how do these things start? It's it's very hard when we, when we examine rituals like these that go back for centuries, some of them for millennia. Uh, of course, we don't know how they started. Uh, in retrospect, there are all kinds of mythical explanations that connect them to specific legends. Um, but... Rituals start all the time. It's just that there's a process of selection there. There's a million rituals born every day. All a very few of them will, will make it down the line. Only the ones that are that are, uh, that are effective in eliciting those uh, those benefits that we discussed will. But sometimes we can see this happen in front of our eyes. And what you said reminded me of um, the rituals of Burning Man. So Burning Man is this festival, I'm sure you've, you've heard of it, where uh, people gather in the middle of the desert in, in Nevada. There's a makeshift city of about 80,000 people who will be constructed and then deconstructed and completely removed uh, within the course of a week. And people who go there, they feel this uh, event uh, as a fundamental part of their identity. They call themselves burners. And they, they associate with other burdens. They create communities. And all that this community is, is a, com- a group of people who come there and enact rituals. Now, how did this start? Well, just a, a few decades ago, uh, somewhere in the 80s, uh, I think, uh, a bunch of people went to the beach and, and, and burned a, a wooden effigy. And they thought it was fun. But they also uh, were interested in in, uh, in the anthropology of rituals. So they, they, they intentionally... Uh, built it as a ritual and it just so happened that a lot of people gathered around and they had a good time and then the next year they gathered a bigger group and, and gradually this this grew to to what it is today a global community of 80,000 people there and, uh, and a million people in other satellite events that people consider very meaningful to them and this has these rituals have emerged both from the uh, bottom up and from the top down so the organizers built some of those on the base of their own readings in the anthropology of religion. But a lot of these rituals just emerged spontaneously from what the crowd was doing. For example, somebody was called to to build a structure, uh, an artist, and she built a structure. He didn't know what, what it was for. It was just a, uh, uh, um, an artistic expression. And... One of the crew members died during the construction of that uh, that building, essentially, and then people came and started 
uh, putting post-it notes on the building uh, mm-hmm. with dedications to people they had lost. And because at the end of this festival, everything burns down, then they gather to see that burn down and they felt this cathartic release of what's in their bad memories being burned. And, and, and the artist said, it was only then that I realized I had built a temple. Only when I saw what people made of it. And now, yeah. of course, this temple is, is huge and, and people uh, gather in the thousands to, to leave notes of their, uh, their uh, talking and photographs of past relationships of uh, uh, people they have lost, the pets they have lost, abusive uh, partners, things they want to leave behind. So this wow. has become a, 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 grief, a grieving ritual. Wow. wow, an amazing modern, you know, example, really. That's, yeah. Of rituals. Jeez, I, I, I'm, it's like a paradigm shift that I've just had. To, you know, I've been enjoying yeah. listening and researching about your work on ritual, but it's only when I talk to you here that it really hits home that to be human is to have rituals and that rituals are the celebration and the glue that binds us as humans. That's the way I see it. So if you, anthropologists have been discussing for, for a very long time about what it is that separates us from other animals. And most of the time they come up with uh, really mundane things. It used to be bipedalism or it used to be tool use. But then of course, Jane Goodall went uh, to live with chimpanzees and came back and told us that they actually use tools and they, they even make tools. And now we know even crows can make tools. And then it was things like cooperation. But of course you look at ants and they have cooperation. One thing after the other, all of these things have collapsed. I think that what truly makes us human is our ability to derive meaning from things that seem to be intrinsically meaningless. Uh, everything we co- yeah. we consider in our lives to be uh, sacred, so to speak, things like uh, uh, art and, and religion and ritual and uh, dancing and, and sports, all of those things are of that kind. They involve symbolism and they involve deriving meaning from seemingly meaningless acts. Wow. Amazing. Brilliant. I've enjoyed this so much. I really, really have. And your book, your book has been translated into how many languages now? Uh, currently 10. 10. That's amazing. Congratulations. And the paperback is coming coming out in January. In January? Okay. So it'll be much more widely available again. And it's, it's, yep. uh, can you tell, can you say the, the title of your book again? Rituals, why this, why the seemingly mundane? The title mundane... is Ritual. And then the, the subtitle is uh, uh, How Seemingly Senseless Acts Make Life Worth Living. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that because rituals really, like, I guess through this conversation, it has reminded me how rituals unite us, help us deal with stress and create meaning in our life and purpose. And is the book on Kindle as well? It's on Kindle. It's on, it's on Amazon. It's on uh, uh, Apple. It's, it's available as audiobook. Uh, you can find it in any form. Did you read the audiobook? No, no. I like it. I did ask for somebody with a British accent, though. Okay, you didn't want I don't a, have one. <laughs> you didn't want a Greek accent on it. I like your Greek accent. Uh, I think it's cool. I really like <laughs> Thank it. you. But uh, I prefer, uh, no, I prefer the, uh, the narrator. Oh, nice. Okay, very, nice. very good. Well, well, thank you. This has been wonderful. And I'm sure everyone listening has really enjoyed it. And I'm sure they're very curious about your book and your extra work. So, yeah, thanks for inspiring us and so many people with your work. I think it's wonderful. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you, Demetrius. Uh, ca- Thank uh, you, guys. Para calor. Para calor. Oh, yeah, I love that Para calor. Yeah. Thanks a million. Cheers. Have a great day. You're Thanks a million. Cheers. Mind yourself Thanks again. Too. Bye-bye. 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 While we have you, once a week we write a newsletter. It's called Happier. It's got simple, tried and tested practices to make your life better. We include recipes and practices that you can apply on a daily basis to make your life happier. We've had lots of people say before that it's really helped make their life better. So you can sign up on the happypairs.ie, our weekly newsletter called Happier.